So the next circulatory disorder we want to look at is infective endocarditis. And in a nutshell, this big nasty booger that's on the heart valve here is a bacterial overgrowth. So we talked about that being a risk with mitral valve prolapse, that that bacterial overgrowth could cause incomplete closure of a mitral valve leading to that mitral valve prolapse diagnosis. But the reason patients develop that is infective endocarditis. So what it is, turbulent blood flow through the heart, incomplete closure of the heart valve, uh, allows for bacteria to settle on the valve. So when we have directional flow through the heart, it can flush things through more effectively. If we have turbulence, it's much more likely that bacteria can settle onto some of those valves in the heart, creating this infective endocarditis. Um, damage to a valve or a prosthetic valve do increase the risk. So anything that increases the amount of turbulence. So if patients have like a scratch or some kind of damage on a valve, there's gonna be turbulence associated with that damage, which can facilitate bacteria settling in that area. Or the prosthetic valves, we talked about anything foreign in the body is a magnet for bacteria and blood clots. So we always wanna watch out for those two things. Um, which can facilitate an infective endocarditis kind of presentation for our patients. Um, the other big, so some of the reasons this can happen. So bacterial colonization, we'll get to the other big risk things here, I was gonna say in a second. Um, so bacterial colonization on the heart valve is what causes infective endocarditis. That is the big thing. It can be either viral or fungal as well. It doesn't have to be bacterial. Um, this can be secondary to dental work. So we talked about that with mitral valve prolapse. Patients have dental work done, so they break their oral mucosa, and there's a lot of bacteria in the mouth, so it can migrate from the oral cavity down to the heart valves and settle there. Um, the other big one, this is the kind of the big thing I was gonna talk about a second ago, is IV drug use. Patients who have poor kind of hygiene practices about needlework on their body. So tattoos, that can be a reason, but primarily IV drug abuse. If patients are not cleaning their needles, their injection sites appropriately, they're at very high risk for developing infective endocarditis. Had a patient who did that, who developed infective endocarditis from long-term IV drug use, he was in the hospital for three months getting antibiotics for this problem. So big, big, big deal. Uh, for these kinds of patients. So the assessment stuff that we're looking for, primarily infective endocarditis causes flu-like symptoms. So shortness of breath, malaise, plus minus fever, that kind of stuff. Um, they may have a heart murmur, either a new one or a changed heart murmur. If they had a congenital heart murmur somewhere else in their heart, then this will develop a new murmur around whichever valve has this bacterial overgrowth. And the bacterial growth can occur on any of the valves. Um, so we wanna listen for heart murmur in these patients. They may or may not always have that, but that's one of the things we wanna listen for. Um, splinter hemorrhages in their nails. So that looks like this. These kind of splinter striated hemorrhages in their nails um, are one of those odd kind of peripheral findings, circulatory findings that we do tend to see with infective endocarditis. Uh, they can also develop swollen nodules on their fingertips. So tends to occur over the knuckles or distally on their fingers. And these swollen nodules can then open up a little bit. So they're almost like raised little papule type things. And we call those Osler nodes. Another big thing that can occur with infective endocarditis, splenomegaly. While we can't observe this or assess it very readily, it is one of those things that can happen as a result of this kind of continuous exposure of the blood to a bacterial or some type of pathogen. Uh, so splenomegaly can be associated with this. So for medical diagnosis, First thing we need to do, screen patients. How do we identify who's at risk, who's not at risk for infective endocarditis? So we talked about IV drug use being a big screening tool. Also recent dental procedures is another big question we ask patients when we start to suspect that they have an infective endocarditis presentation. 
Um, other things we're looking for, Osler's nodes, which are those little papules that tend to occur kind of over the knuckles. They can open up, so they have little uh, like open papules on their fingers. Those are Osler's nodes. And then Janeway's lesions are like little hemangioma kind of things, like little reddened areas on the hands. So Janeway's lesions, Osler's nodes, and those splinter hemorrhages, those are our three very unique symptoms or screening findings that cue us off that a patient may have infective endocarditis. In order to confirm diagnosis, we do blood cultures. Positive blood cultures means that the patient is positive for bacteria in their blood. So culture, think back to microbiology, that's just like you know taking the little wand or a little swabby thing and inoculating a Petri dish. So that's what we're talking about with cultures, is we're trying to grow bacteria from the blood. So positive, meaning there is positive bacterial growth. Whenever we're collecting blood cultures, we do it from two different sites in the body. The reason we do that is to kind of rule out any possible contamination from the vena puncture. So we'll always collect it like left arm, right arm. If a patient has a central line or an IV, we can draw one sample from that device. The other has to be a vena puncture site. So, but we do always get two different sites or two rounds of blood cultures to confirm whether they're positive or not. And then an echocardiogram, because uh, we want to visualize the, the vegetation on the valve. We want to be able to see the regurgitation and the functional disorder caused by that bacterial vegetation. So for our nursing diagnoses for infective endocarditis, not a lot are going on with this because our patients don't have severe symptoms. There can be things like activity intolerance from their poor cardiac output as a result of kind of almost valve prolapse type symptoms, incomplete closure of the heart valves. Um, they can have things like uh, altered respiratory pattern, shortness of, from shortness of breath, um, activity intolerance we talked about, uh, those sorts of things. They can also have impaired skin integrity from the Osler's uh, nodules, um, Osler's nodes, and uh, altered um, disturbed body image from kind of the presentation of all those kind of blotchy Janeway's lesions or some of the streaking uh, from those splinter hemorrhages in their fingernails are some of our infective endocarditis. There's a lot of risk for things too, so like risk for infection uh, associated with IV drug use. Um, if they have infective endocarditis, they're no longer at risk for infection, they actually have it. But until we get that definitive diagnosis, that's one of our big ones is we're trying to rule this out so they're at great risk for it. For our medical plan, prophylactic treatment is a big deal for patients with known disease. So this is um, patients who have kind of a bacterial overgrowth or a valvular disorder. Um, giving them antibiotics prior to having dental work would be an example of like a prophylactic treatment that we give for patients with known medical disease. And then medical management for patients with active uh, infective endocarditis, so active bacterial growth on the heart valve, long-term antibiotics, so three to six months. Uh, so one of the big drugs we give, we, we give really severe or kind of potent antibiotics for this type of uh, infection, one of those being like vancomycin. So it's a broad spectrum, very potent antibiotic. With vancomycin, there's a few things we need to monitor because there's a very high, level, high risk of toxicity associated with that. So vancomycin is a renal metabolite uh, antibiotic, meaning that renal function can be impaired if there's too much antibiotic given. Um, so we need to monitor renal function and a trough level. So we're gonna be drawing therapeutic trough um, of a vancomycin after every third dose. So we wanna make sure that we're not causing vancomycin toxicity in patients like this. Um, surgical management of infective endocarditis, we wanna try and sterilize their circulatory system with antibiotics. Um, if we are able to do that, if we can clean off the bacteria, if that helps eliminate the bacteria on the valves, great, we don't have to go to a surgical route. Oftentimes, we can sterilize the blood, but we can't eliminate the infestation on the valve. So surgical management is what's necessary. 
So a full valve replacement, similar to like our severe mitral valve prolapse presentation. Uh, but it can only happen after antibiotic therapy because we don't want to do surgery on patients who are bacteremic, meaning they have active bacterial growth in their bloodstream. So we do need to sterilize them with long-term antibiotics before we can consider a procedure. Um, most patients are able to manage this long-term antibiotic use as an outpatient. So meaning they can go to an infusion center, kind of like this, get their antibiotic, and then go back out into the world, live their life. Usually they'll have what's called a PIC line, which is PIC stands for uh, peripherally inserted central catheter. So it's a central line, meaning that the end of that PIC line, usually the insertion site is in the arm, but the terminal point, the place where that catheter ends, is all the way back in the superior, in, superior vena cava. So it ends right at the heart. And that's why we call it a central line. So patients can have that IV long-term for sometimes the entire duration of their long-term antibiotics. Um, for patients with a history of IV drug use, this is why we keep them in the hospital this entire time because it's very difficult to send patients who use drugs uh, through IV injection out into the community with a catheter that goes straight to their heart. We don't want to cause a worsening infective endocarditis because of the treatment modality. Um, so we do need to assess for the reason that they developed infective endocarditis as to what kind of treatment options are gonna be available for those patients. The nursing plan, so here's the Janeway's lesions. Um, it's kind of these reddish guys. And these are Osler's nodes. So they're slightly raised. It's difficult to see in the image. Um, and they can open up just a little bit, like almost like uh, little papules that open up. Um, so the assessment stuff, first and foremost, vital signs. These patients have bacterial growth that's encountering their circulatory system. So there's a very high risk of bacteremia leading to sepsis. So we do need to monitor vital signs, make sure our patient is staying hemodynamically stable in the presence of their infective endocarditis. Cardiac assessment, listen for a murmur, new murmurs, worsening murmurs, those sorts of things. Um, and their vascular assessment, because they have that regurgitation, they can develop symptoms, kind of like a mitral valve prolapse, that mimic congestive heart failure. So peripheral edema could definitely become part of the presentation for infective endocarditis. And then those two specific ones, so the Osler's nodes that can occur over the knuckles or over the joints on the fingers, and then the Janeway's lesions, which are these reddened guys right in here. Also the splinter hemorrhages in the fingernails. For implementation, so the things we want to do for these patients, teaching. We need to teach them how to be safe. So first and foremost, dental work. They always, 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 kind of like everybody, needs to use a soft bristle brush. We don't want to cause oral mucosa damage. And also antibiotics prior to any dental procedures. These are also patients that we need to do counseling about not sticking sharp things in their mouth, which sounds like a silly thing that we have to teach patients, but this is things like toothpicks. They shouldn't be using toothpicks or uh, like those flossing things, you know, any of the plastic deals that get in your mouth. We want to avoid those types of things. Only soft objects going in their mouth. Complications, so risk for embolism, big one. We don't want them to develop blood clots around that bacterial growth or in the regurgitation of blood associated uh, with that valve prolapse. So neuro exams uh, are a big one. We wanna make sure that they're not developing signs and symptoms of stroke, meaning that part uh, like a clot has dislodged and gone to their brain. This can be things like our FAST exam. FAST exam is like a very simple, easy to do uh, risk assessment for patients that you suspect have a stroke. So this stands for face, arms, speech, and time. So face, we're looking for facial asymmetry and muscle movement. Uh, arms, do they have equal movement left to right of their arms? Speech, do they have new slurred speech or are they not able to formulate words appropriately? And when was the last time that they appeared normal? Those are the four things we wanna look for for our FAST exams. And then for vascular stuff, we wanna do CMS checks. 
if they've developed one clot, be very suspicious they're gonna develop more clots. So we wanna do CMS checks, so that's circulation, motion, and sensation. So circulation, do they have cap refill? Motion, can they move it? And then sensation, can they feel me touching their distal extremity? So whether that's hands, feet, wherever it may be, that's a CMS check. For evaluation, long-term antibiotics are kind of our go-to thing for infective endocarditis. Uh, we wanna prepare the patient primarily for the duration of this treatment, because being on antibiotics for three to six months, that's a big impact in that patient's life. So we need to prepare them for that as well. Um, also, if they need to be in the hospital for that entire duration, also a big deal. That patient that I had in the hospital who was there for three months getting antibiotics, he actually got evicted from his home because he wasn't out of the hospital to pay rent. So it can be a really big deal and we do need to plan for that with our patients. Um, and then coordinate how they're gonna receive patients, or I'm sorry, <laughs> receive treatment. So for our outpatients, is everything set up at the infusion center? Do they know where to go? Do they know when their first appointment is? All those details we need to provide our patients before we can safely send them out of an acute care facility like a hospital into the community to continue getting treatment. If they're having surgery, we need to prepare them for when that's gonna occur. So when are they gonna have surgery? A lot of times the pre-op visit will take place in the hospital while they're on antibiotics, that long-term antibiotic for their infective endocarditis. So um, for patients going straight from the hospital to surgery, prep them for their surgical procedure. So make sure they know exactly what's going on, verify that consent has been obtained by the physician, uh, that all their questions have been answered, that they're clear on what kind of follow-up care they need to have, those sorts of things. Uh, and then health management, teaching after valve replacement. So again, these are things like antibiotics, long-term antibiotic compliance, um, also long-term anticoagulation. Um, these patients are gonna need that if they do have a full valve replacement. So next, we're gonna be talking about uh, acute pericarditis. But first, let's take a break. <laughs> 